So, the future is already here. This is a quote from a favorite author, author we like, sci-fi author, William Gibson. Hello and welcome everyone to our talk, Entrepreneur, Liberating the Casual Workforce. Right. So, how do we intend to affect this liberation, to set free the casual workforce? We achieve this liberation through our architectural project, Urban Totem. Yep, myself and Eileen, uh, hi everybody. Uh, we are both architects, and as such, we study society. And we study society in order to build environments that facilitate social habits and modern behavior. So uh, that makes us pretty bad voyeurs. <laughs> so essentially, as architects, we, we aim to project a collective future. And we find that this, this is the digital era. We know we live in the digital era. Um, but yet, somehow, in the contemporary cityscape, uh, physical and digital worlds are still somewhat kind of separate. And we would like to change that. Good now. <laughs> and so our project, Urban Totem, focuses on connecting these two worlds. Um, Urban Totem is a street-level, tangible piece of infrastructure that functions to as a display space, a social beacon, and provides access to the digital multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> Urban Totems, digital refueling stations, we like to call them, provide every conceivable digital resource to the passerby. So, whether you're out having your curry roast and you're looking for a place to work on your laptop, or you've been out all day, and you realize your handy is out of battery. Yeah. Um, we're all somewhat connected to our digital devices. Um, that's probably an understatement. <laughs> and so, um, but no one more so than a character that we like to call the entrepreneur. Right, so strange word. Maybe your new word for the day, everybody. Uh, so, it's essentially a mashup. We've taken entrepreneur and flaneur, mashed them together, and we've created this new character called the entrepreneur. But who is, what is a flaneur? Well, essentially, uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia put it best when they described him as an urban explorer, the connoisseur of the street. But like you, uh, if you're not too up on your linguistic history, maybe you don't know this term. But we can see our uh, old flaneur uh, on the boulevards of Paris, circa 1842, uh, and his modern-day counterpart, the entreflaneur, circa right now, on the streets of Kreuzberg or Mitte in Berlin. So, Baudelaire says of the flaneur, the crowd is his domain, as the air is that of the bird or the sea to the fish. Strolling around the city, lounging in the cafes, soaking in the atmosphere of public spectacle, this is this jo guy's job description. <laughs> and adapted to fill his and, create and drive his creative well. Which all sounds really great yep. as a job description. <laughs> um, but most of us have to be a bit more rigorous with our work. That's where the entrepreneur part comes in. Yes. I mean, we, we acknowledge that work has changed. It has been revolutionized. Uh, and the revolution is ongoing. So, in this post-climate uh, crisis, cli cri <laughs> crisis, crisis uh, company, companies' practice, practices, hiring practices have, have been altered. Uh, and so, individuals armed with the tools of digital connectivity increasingly seek to become their own companies. Okay. So, uh, like us, <laughs> our modern-day entrepreneurs uh, are highly skilled, educated, and agile. And part of their impulse Sorry. A part of their impulse towards creativity and innovation is, is directly linked to this connectedness, to this mobility. Uh, and all of this engenders a great sense of personal freedom. Uh, so, you know, for them, the idea of, of being rooted to physical space for work is, is more increasingly unattractive and kind of absurd. And so, let us take you on a quick look back uh, at the work landscape from which our entrepreneur evolved. 
Right. So we can start with office buildings and the dreaded office cubicle of the circa 1950s, 1960s era. Then you cut to the mid-80s when personal home computers became affordable. The home office enters the house. Then, um, by the early 2000s, um, the mobile telephone becomes ubiquitous, especially when they're not the approximate size and weight of a brick. Poor Michael Douglas. So, now we have mobility and a free-range working. We're part of a continuum that led to globalization and produced a round-the-clock work environment. This is no longer the nine-to-five workday, hilariously portrayed by one of our favorite movies of that name, which we recommend. Um, <laughs> but um, so, sorry. Tifa. Right. So then it. Then we get to this deformalized workspace, culminating in a startup culture or a freelance culture, a culture of casual work, where the lines between work behavior and leisure behavior are increasingly blurred. Yeah, I mean, we we now see bigger companies adopting these kind of uh, informal and flexible uh, work practices back in. They take them back into their environments, and so we see faces like uh, Google and Facebook and Pixar, uh, all really proud of their their soft rooms, their chill out zones, and their play areas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Lots of play. Uh, uh, and essentially, these are really all an attempt to create this, this sense of play and freedom in the office environment. Right. But the entrepreneur requires real personal freedom over these artificial types to fuel their productivity and to energize their creativity. And so they go where 90% of human interaction occurs, certainly here in Berlin, the cafe. Okay, now. Okay, now. <laughs> a place where lounging and working occurs seamlessly between mouse clicks, where going to work is less of a displacement in space and more of a behavioral shift. Um, like the flaneurs before them, entrepreneurs revel in the cosmopolitan metropolis, a place of anonymity and spectacle. But unlike the flaneurs, entrepreneurs require social media, digital space. So this digital space can be thought of as part of an invisible infrastructure. Um, this invisible infrastructure is something like the telecommunications networks, the fiber optic cables, the satellite data transmissions, financial algorithms, all these invisible structures that we can't see. That yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like we're surrounded by them every day. And, you know, just imagine for a second if, we, if they were all revealed, if we could see all of this data and radio waves and algorithms, you know, all of this stuff all around us, what, what would it look like? Um, I kind of have a feeling it would look like a crazy digital soup um, and we're somehow all in it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so in that digital soup uh, and with the entrepreneur in mind, We'd like to show you uh, briefly our project Urban Totem, which is a digital refueling station, uh, and it links the physical and digital worlds. Uh, we designed the Urban Totem essentially to harness these, these invisible infrastructures uh, and dedicate them or kind of, uh, especially for the modern uh, knowledge worker. So Urban Totems are mini outdoor rest stops, fully teched up, and all powered by hybrid solar energy. As the name suggests, urban totems are a stacking uh, of vertical, uh, a vertical stacking of vital digital functions. And key amongst them, here's a little info kind of graph, graphic. Uh, key amongst them, there's lots, but key amongst them are high-speed uh, internet, digital device charging when you're, when you're on the go, and web access. Mm -hmm. And these are all free to the user. Uh, free. Yep, totally free. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. 
also they, they integral in the totem is a new iBeacon technology. Uh, so this, this means that you can connect your mobile device uh, anywhere within the, the radius of the totem. And you can, this, this, this iBeacon technology facilitates seamless two-way communication. So essentially, somewhere uh, nearby in the new feature on the streets of Berlin, you will be uh, lounging at a totem, Flaneur style, uh, and you will be able to uh, charge up. Uh, you can access our website, uh, which has got great uh, cultural content and things like that, and a really good insider city guide. Uh, yeah. We all okay. we like to think of it also in this in these terms. Okay, yes. Yeah, so right, so we can we think of it also, these urban totems, as a kind of urban acupuncture, connecting the invisible energies of infrastructure through key points along the city's collective body. By connecting totem to totem, or city to city, this gives rise to an entirely new model of connectivity, one that is virtual and physical simultaneously. This is the city of the future. Orla and I are inspired by Berlin's use of the streets to speak civically through art and demonstration. And so urban totems are purposefully put into the streets creating a brand new symbiotic relationship between the streets and the web. Yeah, and this, this symbiosis occurs through the transfer of information, backwards and forwards via upload and download. And across three key platforms, we have the Urban Totem website, the mobile app, and the interactive screen. And the interactive screen is really important um, because it acts as a real-time window uh, a highly visible showcase for a new generation of startups and innovators. Uh, also for video artists, musicians, uh, a, a future multitude of creative endeavors. And thus, we hope uh, to, um, to create a new cultural stimulus for Berlin. Additionally, urban totems identify a yet undeclared need in society, that of providing a new type of workspace Essentially, docking stations, accessible, domestic, free, for the migratory worker, the freelancer, and the entrepreneurs, roaming around with their personal mobile devices, looking to plug in. Yeah. Because, you know, let's face it, we, we, we all want to be everywhere. We want to be in the, virtual, in the virtual domain, and at the same time, somewhere interesting and inspiring in the real world. And Urban Totem is that place. Uh, it's not just a digital refueling station for when you're running low on juice, <laughs> but it's also a vital resource and a cultural beacon and the natural habitat of the entrepreneur. So Vielen check Dank. us out, uh, urbantotem.de. Thanks very much. Danke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will have a little discussion all, on all the three um, projects afterwards. So you can ha have a seat if you want to sit here or over there as, as you wish. Um, so please keep all your questions in mind about uh, Urban Totem. Um, the next project that we're going to learn about is uh, Connecting Cities. And uh, please, Susa Pop, um, welcome to the stage. She is um, the founder of Public Art Lab and a designer. And a curator, as she said. Is there a microphone? Is it going to take some minutes? Because if there are any questions, maybe we can just have them now. <laughs> questions? Oh. Yeah, hello. Um, who actually designed the urban totem? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought it was on. Yeah, we, we work this out between us. Uh, we work it back and forth. I'll work on it for a while, then Orla. And that way, it's more of a rounded discussion rather than an ego trip. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Brauchst du doch das Mikrofon? Bitte schön. 
Hello, everybody. Yes, thank you for the introduction. My name is Susa Pop, and um, I'm the initiator of a project called Connecting Cities, what I'm going to uh, shortly present you today. And uh, it's a project uh, uh, which is a multi-annual EU-funded project, a culture program 2007 and 13. And uh, we collaborate uh, with 12 European cities. And now it's a worldwide expanding network of um, most of our partners are institutions, who, yes, uh, deal with this whole issue of urban screens and media facades and um, the cultural potential of these infrastructures. Uh, maybe just a couple of words how we started. Uh, I actually started uh, with uh, Miriam Struppek, uh, who is an urban planner and now living in Torino. And uh, we organized a couple of uh, Media Facades Festival here in Berlin um, at 2008. It was the time uh, when the first, uh, yes, huge uh, how can I say, digital screens have been set up at, um, at the Media Spray uh, project at the River of Spray in Kreuzberg. And um, yes, as they were only showing advertisement, we have been thinking um, what is the socio-cultural potential of these infrastructures. And as they are set up in the public space, they should also, um, yes, show cultural content. So with this sense of reclaim the screens, we started these first Media Facades Festival and asked artists to develop participatory projects um, with, these, uh, with these urban screens. And it was also interested, uh, interesting um, at this time to find out that they are all operated uh, through the internet. So the next step after 2008 was to think about a networked infrastructure. Um, in a European Media Facades Festival, we connected already seven cities uh, with these um, screens and um, yes, and um, what, I, what is, how can I say, the potentials? This is uh, what I'm going to show you today with this Connecting Cities project. Okay, this was too much, sorry. A little bit sound is nice, but I'm also going to talk. Okay. Yes, yeah, so some of uh, these partners, um, which I'm going to present you, they um, they use the screens um, for uh, temporary usage to show cultural content others are owners of media facades and um, so they have uh, quite uh, different challenges and um, we also use of course projections and um, what is interesting with this um, with this medium is that it's we often define it as a membrane between the internet and uh, the public space the urban space and um, so therefore uh, what we created and what you will see when you have a look at this film a lot of do-it-yourself tools and devices uh, for social interaction uh, with the urban screens. So, um, for example, um, some of the partners, what I said, like Linz Ars Electronica, is um, a, a challenge, the ch their challenge is to show um, permanently cultural content, and uh, it's a, role, a resolution media facade. So, depending on the resolution, of course, on the place, and of course, on the urban context, um, it is. Uh, the criteria of what kind of content you are going to show and how you would like to uh, challenge or use them as a social platform for interaction. We had uh, three uh, city scenarios uh, what we uh, yes explored in the last years. The first one was uh, the network city. So how to use these infrastructures um, for citizens to have a, a, an intercultural dialogue from one to one city. And um, the second one was the participatory city in 2014. Um, what 
what here we explored the space around the screen, in front of the screen, as kind of shared encounters. How uh, can the people use them for opinion building, uh, but also, of course, for uh, all kinds of, uh, yes, co-creating cities and uh, exchanging with each others. And uh, this year is uh, the visible and invisible city topic where we are going to use them as zones for visualization of um, invisibly generated data or technologies. And all of our partners, um, we co-curate and co-produce the content together. So um, there is always an open call where artists can apply and uh, we uh, select the projects uh, together. And, um, and then everyone is creating, every curator is creating his or her own program um, depending on the local context. I think it's very important um, if you work with these uh, massive infrastructures to start from a site-specific point of view. As um, yes, as it's a, it's a global medium, it's very important to to think about uh, the local community, your audience, with whom uh, you would like to develop the projects. Um, Collegium Hungaricum, for example, here in Berlin was a, a wonderful place for us, and still is a wonderful place, of course, with a real projection window, you could, um, and the four plays, um, we could experiment a lot, and in total, I think we um, now um, curated and co-produced around uh, 70 projects. And... Um, Yes, so for example, if you have a look at this uh, project, which is a good example for Network City, uh, you have been looking into other cities, your eye was tracked and projected uh, in the other city and watching the other people. And also artists like Jeremy Bailey, who use them as a more mobile screen. Here he is represented on the iPad um, and talking to the people uh, remotely, um, yes, telepresently from his office and studio in Toronto. So these are a lot of examples for network scenarios. Most of them are playful, but of course you can also use them in a, in a critical way. And um, and uh, what, what is interesting about this medium that we are very often invited to a smart city conferences. So when it's all about uh, this bottom-up approach to smart cities or social smart cities, um, then it's of course interesting to have a look at this medium as a place for encounters, so shared encounters and of course also um, uh, to have a look at the possibilities of how you can participate and, and co-create uh, your city. I think this is this interesting part. And um, yes, so most of the projects also go to the neighborhoods. It's not only that they are just in front of the screen, like this project here, the telepuppet uh, show, um, they go to the neighborhoods, include the people and uh, bring them back to the, to the um, Yes, it depends whether it's the projection wall or media architecture. In general, we are talking about uh, the urban media environment. And um, some projects, for example, like this one, I would also like to mention Smart Citizens Dashboard. Uh, it's an interesting project of Nina Valkanova. So they were asking, for example, the people about their cities and, uh, and they could, on different topics and issues, uh, vote and give their opinion about um, the living or about uh, housing, about working situations in their cities. And... Um, also, this one, for example, uh, what, what you see here in the background uh, is, yes, like a flash mob dance where the people use mobile devices and uh, it was a choreography, how they were dancing all together and uh, using the screen as a kind of, um, yes, a platform for meetings and uh, uh, after uh, they had this uh, excursion to the neighborhoods. Another one from two Istanbul artists who used them for opinion building. So they were also asking a lot of political questions where the people could answer. And um, they were visualized on the media facade of the Ars Electronica Center, but also in other cities. And um, yes, um, what, what I would say is um, this whole... Uh, 
exploration of this medium started with urban screens and of course we were also collaborating with a lot of urban screens networks but uh, they all have um, yes their own business models and this uh, business model has of course a lot to do with um, um, with the outreach of a mass audience, so what they prefer, of course, is that a lot of people pass by the screens in a very short time, and so um, they are not so much interested in social interactions with screens. Um, so the more and more um, we collaborated with um, institutions, cultural institutions, or city-run um, uh, screens, so uh, who use them as a community platform and um, where, of course, we can, uh, yes, uh, create much more uh, projects who have this participatory element. And um, now this year, the Visible and Invisible City uh, will take place in Jena in Germany. It is a small town and a center of optical technologies. And here we cooperate closely with the companies and the universities. So the artists are invited to use uh, these optical technologies uh, to make um, invisibly generated data technologies uh, visible to the public audience. And uh, it's a project for which we uh, created the City Culture Science Lab, a platform where the companies, but also universities and city actors meet constantly and have the um, possibility to co-create this festival, which will take place um, in October, from the 7th to the 11th of October. And um, as one part of the Connecting Cities activities in eight further cities. So so in uh, Jena we will also uh, be connected with uh, the Ars Electronica festival but at the same time um, with uh, Guangzhou which is the partner city in China. And um, yeah, so you of course are warmly welcome and um, so far uh, this is the last project of Julian Oliver who were working hacking the screens with a wireless access point and um, to, uh, transferring uh, the content to the public screen. There are a lot of partners involved and as I already said it's funded by the European Union and uh, yes, so thank you very much for your interest and I think further questions we can ask afterwards. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you very much. So the third project we will learn about is um, Make City. Um, I welcome to the stage Francesca Ferguson. She is founder and CEO of Urban Drift. She's curator of architecture and urban issues. Do you have a microphone? Yes. yes. Good. So. Stage is yours. Thank you. Yeah, hello and um, thanks for, to Republica for this opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm here to do a brief presentation of something which <clears throat> has evolved um, over the last couple of years in Berlin and with Berlin, um, a lot of different partners, Make City, um, the Festival for Architecture and Urban Alternatives. I put up the German title because it's actually bilingual, the whole thing. Um, Das Festival für Architektur und Anders machen. Um, it's um, taking place in June. And um, so it's evolved um, from a position where looking at what Berlin might need or should need or seems to need. Um, I'm a curator of architecture and urban issues. Um, and I have actually been in this city pretty much continuously since the wall came down. And... Um, there's never been a kind of complete uh, format or festival that's, kind, that's dealt with um, the intense pace and level of change um, that have dominated Berlin um, and the current state that we're in, in particular. So, um, when I say it's evolved, this festival from and with Berlin, um, what struck me always over all these years is that the city is kind of always been the site for sort of small scale or middle scale or larger scale urban prototypes. Um, for example, 
using the roofs of the city for urban gardening. Um, we had a situation where we had a, one of the largest spaces of commons, of urban commons in, in, in our city, a Tempelhof, where um, it was, became very clear um, when there was a referendum um, in 2013 now, I think, yeah. Um, and over 65% of citizens decided to vote against the Senate, the Berlin Senate's urban master plan for developing the space of the former airfield Tempelhof and the surrounding um, of this vast piece of tract of land. Um, it was a resounding no vote. Um, and this was a kind of a wake-up call for the local government, I think, to sort of rethink how citizens um, are, want to be involved and can be involved and perhaps should be involved in the process of urban development. Another background to make city is actually something that you may have experienced yourselves if you've been here a longer time. Temporary gardens, um, projects like this developed with cultural funding by Atelier Lebalto, landscape architects. There are numerous urban intervention and urban space projects that have been developed not only in Berlin but in other cities under the kind of guise of a cultural project, i.e. this is art, this is not about urban development. And I sort of wanted to um, make, encourage a shift in that perception because I think that when you have projects like this, temporary gardens developed at the back of uh, museum spaces or in interstitial, le interstitial and leftover spaces of the city with very, very minimal means, um, the landscape arch architects Atelier Lebalto developed a particular aesthetic based on what's already there, including weeds, overgrowth, you know, just um, Brachenvegetation, as you might say in German. Um, and it's sort of, um, it's a very significant thing to have done, and it's done in the guise of being an art or artistically funded project. I think this has to do with a completely different perception of making city, whether this be a small scale or whether this can be developed on a bigger scale. And um, so this quote's in, in, in German because I think some of you also may be German speaking. Um, one of the things that drove this idea of make city is the fact that more and more people are looking upon Berlin at a moment where there's an extreme paradigm shift going on. You have um, increased amount of interest from investors in the public lands of the city, or in general, the land and the, and the, and the spaces to be developed. Um, Berlin has been selling off its public lands to the highest bidder for a number of years. And um, architects who established here, including David Chipperfield and others who are looking upon the city, have a saying that basically, um, even though Berlin is not known for its industrial and economic strength, um, it's it's discovered something that is much more interesting, which is a kind of, it's extreme contradictions, a kind of richness um, based on the extreme complexity and contradictions that epitomize the city. Um, and on that basis, we are looking with Make City at the notion of something which is, um, I think, a relevant issue when you talk about the moment in the city that we're experiencing right now, this paradigm shift. Um, on the one hand, you have this huge interest in development. On the other hand, you have a kind of increasing pressure on housing, on raising rents. There's a lot of um, gentrification going on. Some people may say this is a classic normal development of any city that's undergoing um, a change and <clears throat> that this is, this is standard. In a place like London, perhaps we hardly ever talk about gentrification anymore. Um, but um, we talk now with Make City, or we rather try and assemble a whole scene, a whole discourse, looking at the resources of cities. We, 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 the, the, the sort of theme of Make City this year in its first, let's say, inauguration <laughs> as a festival is resourcing the urban, urbane ressourcen neu aufgelegt, which means looking at the resources of the city on every level. And um, there is a kind of a European discourse here because we are trying to bring together participants, thinkers, city makers, um, who are reflecting upon economies, urban economies, that are increasingly under strain. I mean, in Europe, we have a situation where we're talking about austerity economics. Uh, what does that mean? How does that impact 
on the public services of a city. So Make City is kind of governed by perhaps or, or led by three main themes. We're looking at the notion of urban commons. That's definitely inspired by um, what I was showing you before, these temporary gardens, moment in Tempelhof, and an, ex an incredibly um, powerful, I would say, politicization of the citizens of Berlin um, on the basis of the fact that public lands have been sold to the highest bidder and citizens' groups are realizing this is something that should be stopped. You have the development of round tables and civic groups that are protesting, that are trying to stop the Berlin Senate from continuing to sell land to the highest bidder. Um, and what's evolved now, interesting enough, is people are talking about a Berlin model, even though it's not, Berlin is not the initiator of this, but it's called the Konzeptverfahren in German, the, the, the notion that a concept needs to be attached to any property development notion of, of, of a space that is available, a piece of land that is available, that it's no longer okay that the investor with the high, the, the, that bids the most um, gets a piece of land or a piece of property in the city. And um, quite recently, the federal government stopped the sale of a huge um, area of Kreuzberg called the Dragona Areal, um, and this was a message, in a way, from the, from, 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 on a federal level, too, that this pressure from below, from civic groups, um, on uh, regarding public lands, and we could talk about this as commons, as, the, as, as land property that is shared, um, that this is going to create an ex a very powerful change in the way one deals with um, further urban and property development in the city. So the notion of commons is absolutely paramount to make city. Look at what's happened in, in, um, in this massive former airfield of Tempelhof. You have gardens that have, community gardens that have been built by citizens, by civic groups, by individuals, completely sort of helter-skelter, completely ad hoc, um, very cheaply, very basic. And this is far away from the notion of the allotment or the Schrebergarten, that you have your little plot of land with a fence around it. So there's completely different forms of sharing and neighborliness that evolves from projects like this. We're also looking at landscape architecture from based on the notion that it can be developed in a participatory way. For example, this is a project by Topotec Landscape Architects in Superkielen in Denmark. It's an extremely formal realization of the notion of multicultural, multiculturalism, um, which is debatable, but it was developed in a participatory way, i.e. The, the citizens in this part of, of Copenhagen were able to submit um, designs of, or, or rather um, photographs and, and sketches of elements in public space and in uh, public gardens that remind them of their own culture. And Topotec, as landscape architect, selected those individual pieces to create a kind of a manifestation of multicultural space. Whether or not that functions in reality is left open that you'd have to experience it yourself. But the notion, can you actually design for diversity, is one of the um, issues when we're talking about commons. Another of the themes that is linked, of course, to this whole notion of civic engagement is um, urban open source, where we're using the expression from coding. Um, in German, we, we talk about particip participation and sharing. Um, but the notion of open, uh, uh, open source, that everyone, in the case of coding, of course, they we're talking about experts, not amateurs, who are working on code. Um, but we're looking at the idea that actually civic groups and citizens can manifest and design and be part of creating an urban environment. Examples like this, we have guests coming from uh, Zuloark, um, Spanish architecture collective that basically occupied a piece of abandoned land in, in Madrid and created the Campo de Sabada, um, which became a kind, kind of a commons, a sort of ad hoc design commons. Um, how to maintain and design that notion of a shared space of commons is sort of debated and debatable within the festival. 
And of course, there are the sort of classic notions of participation where children are involved, let's say, in transforming their own kita. There are practitioners, architects like Susanna Hoffmann from the Baupiloten who have been doing this for years. Um, a lot of this festival is in a way about make, drawing attention to small scale, small acts that collectively say something quite powerful about alternative ways of making city or urban alternatives. And I think it's really great to be part of um, Republica um, because, and uh, I think uh, it has a lot to do with the fact that this year the Wissenschaftsjahr Zukunftsstadt, City of the Future, was able to create a push for this debate on urbanism within the context of Republica by, by funding this. I think it's really interesting because what we're trying to do with Make City is not bring together uh, the usual crowd of architects and developers, um, or even architects who usually sit amongst themselves and developers who sit amongst themselves and art practitioners who sit amongst themselves. And what we're trying to do is bring all of these elements together in a way that people will say is quite contradictory because in the festival center, um, we're going to have a mix of people talking about the civic economy and crowdfunding for example, this bridge in Rotterdam was a crowdfunded project um, organized by Zeus um, Zone, Zone Urbain Sensible um, at an architecture biennale in Rotterdam. We're bringing together these ideas of new technologies, sharing uh, of the notion of transparency and sharing information. Uh, so, so a discourse that's actually definitely coming out of the design scene and also even the hacker scene. Uh, and bring this together with um, people who are talking about urban governance and how, in fact, all of these new technologies that enable a different form of information sharing and a different form of transparency can, in fact, impact on the way that local government um, or stadt management, urban management is carried out, is determined. And you have these projects where... Um, where you have uh, uh, the, the Berlin Senate, for example, local government talking about the concept for fun, the notion of conceptual development of, a, of an area. One of the largest um, development sites in Berlin is Südliche Friedrichstadt, southern part of Fried, Fried, Friedrichstraße, um, a former um, flower, uh, flower market, Blumen Großmarkt, a vast area where you have three different groups of architects and investors developing um, individually lots of land and building um, commercial development and housing and um, a, a mixed use. And what's happened here is that the architects themselves created the conditions for a shared conceptual development of the area, i.e. they went far beyond what they were commissioned to do by the investors. Um, they made a push and won the bid for, this, for these uh, pieces of of land at the Blumengrossmarkt, and they're politicizing their whole practice. That means they're getting together and they are talking not just about their building in the square meterage and getting the maximum rental out of, uh, or, or sale price out of each square meter. They're talking about how to go beyond that to develop the spaces around the buildings and to develop a social project. And one of those social projects is going to be the Bauhütte, which is basically a kind of a social container, if you like, for a whole connection with the local area. So this is the kind of thing people will be talking about. And we're looking at new forms of living and working in the city. That's one of the third big themes. Um, and um, oh, is, will, will, our, will our sort of uh, looking at Baugruppen, looking at forms of creating new architecture where actually there are social and communal spaces created in residential spaces. Um, we're talking about urban um, high-rise and buildings built entirely of wood because this is another way of thinking city differently and designing city differently. And of course, there's always this kind of nostalgic look at <laughs> how for parts of the city, and this is connected then to a wider debate because this is not just the case in Berlin, how waterfronts are developed. How much of the waterfront is public? How much is private? How much do we have to fight for the fact that there needs to be um, greater accessibility from the, on the water side. You have huge lobbies that also determine 
particularly in Germany and Berlin, how the water's, water is used, how the, the waterways of Berlin are used. And so we'll have landscape architects and people talking about how to develop a different form of public park or public walkways along these, um, the banks of the Spree. The, of course, there's going to be a festival center, and that's a, a, that's a, a site for debate, the former Czech center in the middle of Berlin. And um, one of the really important things, I think, in trying to go, I, I haven't talked about one of the most important things, which is how this is financed, but I'll get to that. Um, but one of the most important things um, that we're trying to do is to make this notion of making city, thinking city differently, urban alternatives, or anders machen, making that accessible and something that can be experienced by everyone. So Make City Open is one of the formats. It's a whole series of tours, over 45 different tours around the city, um, carried out by people who are not professional tour leaders. Like, for example, we'll have a performance group talking about Cottbus Tour, where there was a social movement against the raising of rents of a, of a, of a huge um, area there of social housing. Um, we'll have naturally landscape talk, architects talking about urban landscapes of commons and how to design them in an intelligent way, but also um, new models for living together, because I think one of the phenomena um, and I can say this is why this place may be such a magnet at the moment to so many um, people of different uh, walks of life is because there's a notion that there's still a certain amount of uh, Freiraum, free space, um, conceptually speaking, financially speaking, to develop other forms of um, other models of living or an, an other, a, a, a project with a difference. So we're looking at, in, in, this, in this respect with Make City, we're looking very much also at um, different forms where people, different ways where people have, have come together to create a multi-generational um, uh, residential space out of a former school in Karlshorst. Or we're looking at um, former industrial areas that have been converted to, to cultural use. It's about trying to make uh, different forms of living together, um, even communal housing or co-housing, uh, something that can be experienced by the audience. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of cultural centers included in this uh, festival. I think one of the most important things that, uh, to say in, as a final note about how this project evolved is that um, we didn't receive the classic funding from the Berlin Senate or for, um, uh, we, have, we have funding from the science here, the Wissenschaftsjahr, but in fact this whole festival, or rather almost two thirds of it, has been financed by founding partners, so individuals and architects that have contributed an average of 1,500 euros each to make this possible. And those people are co-designing the event. So when you see all the different partners involved, they've actually co-designed and co-curated it. So it's participatory and it's, quite, it's trying to be different from, let's say, a classic um, biennale or festival that is kind of top-down, managed by a handful of curators. And I think that's the exciting thing. So there's a whole kind of mid-level also scene of architects and designers and planners uh, young, established, successful, you know, mid-scale, mid who have determined the ideas and the debate. And I think that's one of the things that I think is, is kind of very exciting for me personally to have experienced in the last um, eight months or so in, in the evolution of the festival. Thanks. Sorry I've taken a bit longer. Thank you very much, Francesca. Would you join the others on the stage? Um, so, we now have the possibility to have some questions. Are there any questions? So, you know now that we need some questions, you can think about them. Um, my question would be for um, Urban Totem is, um, there are so many people that want to occupy these spaces, so um, what was the reaction of the city and other people when you said we want to put those urban totems in the city. Um, is this well, on? Oh, yeah. Oh, is this on? Uh, yeah, gen generally we've had, we've had a really good reaction so far. I think, I think the key is that uh, it offers something back. That, of course, the financial model will have to be funded 
partly by advertising, that that's kind of just a reality. Uh, and, and we're working on the basis <coughs> of so many digital businesses that, that, that people get uh, content and information for free, and ours is a service, I guess, services for free. Uh, and in return, there's a kind of pay or a, a trade-off, I guess, of a small amount of advertising. But for, for us, um, as architects and, and, and interested in the arts, etc., for us, the main thing that I can give over to the city is this kind of showcase, this, this um, uh, very visible uh, space for people to display their ideas. And uh, so it, in that way, I think uh, it's, it's had a good reaction. Yeah, generally, we've had a really good, good reaction. So when, when are we going to see the first totems in the city? <laughs> That's a good that question. Is a question. Um, our parents are asking as well. Um, <laughs> they might be, yeah. um, well, we have a timetable that's um, dependent on a few ongoing negotiations. So hopefully, hopefully, um, so the first launch will be next summer. That's what we're aiming yeah. for. And That's will this be in Berlin work. or else? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, we have to start it here. We, we're in love with the city. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Not, I think what's yeah. interesting in this case is how um, <laughs> you've basically been quite, um, you know, you, you're working like in a way a startup. I mean, you yeah. know, you're just basically putting out this yeah. product and making sure that it gets um, <coughs> that it manifests itself in the city. No one's commissioned you to do this, right? No, no, it doesn't. Or, or no one commissioned you to do media media uh, screens either. <laughs> no one commissioned me to do Make City. I think that's one of the interesting things about these these kinds of oh. evolution, though. No? Yeah, that it's not. Uh, yeah, commissioned. Yeah. It's not someone. Doing yeah, it. it's a new way of um, <coughs> for, for architects to work. We usually wait for a client um, to roll in the door, but now it's it's sort of we're kind of. The other way around. Doing the other thing, starting up, yeah. doing startups, because it's, yeah. it's kind of possible uh, lately. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, any questions to these three interesting projects? <laughs> so, this Make, make, make It City? Make City. Make City. Um, you, you're saying you didn't get any um, um, local, 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 yes. Um, from the city, but what did the city say? Will they listen to what, what, what you're... Well, um, we hope so. I mean, what's happening now is that the pressure is kind of greater because a lot of the um, participating architects, collectors, cultural centers that are developing program for the festival, they are actually calling upon various local politicians to be at their events. So there's this, suddenly there's this collective pressure sort of on uh, representatives of the Berlin Senate. Um, so it's less me personally asking them. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time trying to involve them in the discourse and in the evolution of the project, but uh, there's a long history of Berlin authorities being extremely kind of hands-off with things like this and waiting very much to see mm. if a format is successful or not mm. before they associate themselves with it. So, but you still now have the thinking that they might be listening because they, they need to listen to you, don't they? Well, I mean, I think, I think as I say, it, there's a kind of a kind of, there's a kind of Narrenfreiheit, uh, in a way, there's a kind of absurd freedom to having, uh, of course we have our commitments to founding partners. Um, it's, it's a commitment because we're doing, they, we're offering them a platform, so we have to, to we have contracts with them all, um, but there is, uh, beyond that, having a kind of sponsorship money, etc., and having a, a kind of, a very, um, interesting form of funding, which is purely by chance from the city of the future, which the, the Wissenschaftsjahr Zukunftstadt, the city of the future theme this year, purely by chance. Um, they're just happy that some the projects like this evolve, so they don't interfere. Um, and I think there's a, there's a great freedom there um, to to say things. I think that's what a lot of the architects are doing. They're basically using the festival, not just oh, I open my doors, there's a few crates of beer in my studio, and you can come on an evening and talk to me about stuff. No, they've actually developed program according to our three key themes. So the whole program is, is that's the one thing we said. There's a framework, there are three main key issues. Please relate everything you do, whichever format you choose, to those issues. And that's what they're doing. And they're using it as a political platform, many of them. Okay, so any questions evolving? <laughs> no? I have a question, actually. Yeah. What I, what I find interesting in the Make City um, idea is this, this relationship between, um, between the experts, uh, 
you know, whether they be coders or architects, and the community, and how that interaction happens. Because you mentioned the ESAL project, the one with the Bloom Garden uh, mocked. Um, and that one's really interesting because, as you said, the architects not just make the building or the details for the building, which is quite a thing in itself, but to, to design the interaction with the community. That's another entire design of, of stuff. So I find that very, very interesting in a way that we're all kind of stepping outside of our comfort zones, maybe, and, and trying these new formats, whether it's a startup, whether it's community organizing, um, because you know, you want to empower people, but you want to also direct all that energy in a really um, good way that's, that's productive, you know, so that voices are heard and it's, it's interesting, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, because, and also, and also the, the, um, it's, it's, it's never economical for an architect, ever, yeah. to indulge in participation, yeah. participatory planning, <laughs> unless, like the project in Copenhagen in Denmark, there is the city as an investor and they pay a, a, a company yeah. that is specialized in participatory planning and design. Uh -huh. And they do the website and they wow. talk to all the citizens and they organize all that. But actually, um, you know, beyond the sort of symbolic uh, post-it, you know, citizens yeah. can put their wishes on a post-it sticker and stick it on a wall. I mean, the moment you really start to get to grips with true participation of the, of, of, of the future users of a building or the future uh, residents, you know, you grapple with a lot of issues and yeah, a lot yeah. of problems. And, it, and it's, it, it's sweat equity. Sure. I mean, you're not yeah. paid for it yeah. necessarily. But um, investors have to wake up and listen a bit more to this because yeah. the fact is they're going to be under pressure to prove that they are, in fact, developing with the future residents or the local residents in mind. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and they won't just be able to get away with plonking down another yeah. kind of loft living mm. development or, yeah. you know, with offices attached. You know, they, you can't get away with that so much anymore. Yeah, that's great. That's true. Okay, do you have a question? No, I'm ha having a sign, no more questions. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, for your interesting projects, and we will um, continue in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>